Now, if you open your Bibles with me to uh, Galatians chapter 1, Galatians chapter 1, and by the way, um, welcome if, you're the first, if, you're, if it's your first time here. And what we do here is we go through the Bible. We teach through the Bible. If you're here long enough, um, and uh, by the way, we've been here 18, I've been here 18 years, and we still have, we've been through the New Testament, this is our third time through, but we still have one more book of the Bible to really say we've been through the whole Bible, but what I'm saying is it takes a long time to do that, um, uh, but eventually, Lord willing, we'll get to the whole Bible. But just the point being is that we continue through the Bible, and here's what I've always found in the, in the time that I've been here, um, is that God meets us, whether it's current events or what's going on in the world, or what happens to be going on in this particular body of believers, all through the years, he's met us faithfully right there, wherever we are in the Bible. And to me, if you, in other words, applications, we needed to hear just what was there in the Scriptures for that particular point in time. I've seen it over and over and over in my own life as I, as I study the Bible. And to me, because I don't, I don't pick, I mean, I, I, I know where I'm going to start every week. And I, kinda, I guess I, you could say I pick where we stop. Um, but the idea is God is so wise that the way that it works out in the Bible so many times, it, he meets us right where we are, and he's done that again right now to meet us in the current place that we find ourselves as a nation. And to me, only God could do something like that. Man could not engineer something like that. Maybe once or twice. Maybe it's happened to you. You went to church sometime, and, and uh, the pastor was up there speaking, and and you look over at people that invited you and said, Who did you tell the pastor what, what's going on in my life right now? Well, that's the Holy Spirit, and he's meeting a person where he is. And the, per the reason he does that is so that he can show himself real in, in a person's life. So we've arrived at Galatians, the book of Galatians. Just a little bit about what's happening here and the reason for the Apostle Paul writing this letter to the church, churches, in Galatia, which is a region in Turkey, modern-day Turkey, you could say, and the Apostle Paul, missionary, he was, he was on missionary journey, and he goes out and he's preaching the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, and people received that good news. These were non-Jews, Gentiles, and they received the good news of Jesus Christ, and they repented of their sin, and as a result of that, churches were planted in the region of Galatia. And if you can remember back, if you're a born-again Christian here, when you first got saved, it's always good to go back and revisit that time in your heart and mind and the freshness, the newness of life. You know, today's a beautiful day. I've got to tell you something, living in Southern California... This is what it's like just about, I'm not exaggerating, just about every day it's like this. The weather's just about like this. I'm serious. And you talk to people there and, and you say to them, hey, how you doing? Well, just another day in paradise. And what they meant by that was, it's pretty surfacey. It's like, wow, it's like, it doesn't get any better than this weather-wise. Um, but... Paul planted these, he planted these churches, and at the beginning, it was like that. When you first get saved, another day in paradise. I mean, the world is still the broken place that it was. Sin is abounding all around us, but at that moment in time when you first get saved, at least for me, it was like, I was so excited about, I mean, every... It could have been a rainy day and everything was beautiful. The clouds, look at those cloud formations and, and, and the wonder of the rain, the way that it waters the, the ground and, and all these things. And, and that's in the newness of life. And as you go on in Christianity, I, I, not that you lose the wonder, um, but we need to be reminded of, of, of so many things. And maybe that's what happened in Galatia. Because they received Christ. They had the newness of life. And, and the reason I, what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is they turn from it. And because Paul writes at the very beginning, 
He says, man, I'm, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase in verse 6 of chapter 1. He says, I, I'm blown away that you guys are turned away from Jesus. He couldn't believe it. So soon, is what he was saying. So soon. What had happened? Had Jesus let them down? No. Somebody came along and told them that, yeah, yeah, you got Jesus, but there's something you need to add to him, which was Judaism in that case. And, and they said, oh, okay, well, you know, we want, you know, we can improve upon the gospel, the good news. And, and I would say to you what Paul is writing about, he's telling them this is not an improvement. You can't improve upon something that's perfect. Just stick to the foundation, just stick to the fundamentals, if you want to call it that. And, and you know, in, you know I, those of you that don't know anything about sports analogies, I'm sorry, but this is true in a lot of things that we do. Whether you're, you know, you're in sports or but you're knitting, I'm sure. I know nothing about knitting or sewing, nothing at all, but I bet you it's still true. There are fundamentals, fundamental things that you do. You get good at the fundamentals and keep to the fundamentals and you don't stray and forget about the fundamentals, right? And that's like in basketball, that was certainly true. In, in football, you know, blocking and tackling, you know, and, and just very fundamental things. They're not real flashy necessarily. Um, you stick to those things, man, you're going to be fine and you're going to do well. And you could say the fundamentals of, of, of Christianity are the gospel. The good news. And, and, and so today, you know, we're living in a world, can't we tell by looking at the news that there's something broken? Right? There's something very broken, what's going on in our midst, right? And, um, you know, pandemics, you know that the pandemic, it's a, it's a pestilence the Bible talks about. That was not there at the beginning. In the creation, there was no viruses, before Adam and Eve sinned, there was no viruses. We were without viruses. There was no cancer. None of that stuff in the beginning. Because how do we know that? It doesn't say there's no cancer in the beginning in the book of Genesis. But how do we know that? Because God said, he looked at everything he made, and he said, it's very good. Now, cancer is not very good. The COVID-19 virus is not very good. It's just not. Death is not very good. Now, in Christ, he can take beauty, he can take the ashes and make beauty out of it. I mean, he, and all things can work together for good, right? Those things can work together for good in a Christian's life, you could say, and, and all that, but they're not good by themselves. They came in later. What happened? How did they get here? Well, the Bible says that when, when man sinned, Adam sinned, in came sin, which came death, and all the other things that came with viruses and, and, and behaviors and everything else. And that's what we're seeing in our world today, from the COVID-19 to, to rioting and, and, and people hurting one another. Um, you know, we see abuses of power all around us, and the, that is a result of sin. We need to bottom line that. It's all a result of sin. And so that was what was happening in the first century as a result of, of, of sin. And that's what's happening today. And so the same answer that the Apostle Paul was bringing to the, to the region of Galatia is true for us today. If you're a born-again Christian here today, you are not powerless in this day and age. But... What I want to talk to you about is just a reminder to you today. Because I'm, um, I'm seeing a lot of things in a lot of places where, um, I mean, we teach, you know, we teach Jesus here and everything else over and over, but I'm, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm looking at what's going on in the church, not just in the world, but in the church. And I'm seeing that the church, in some ways, is not totally convinced, I don't think, of what the, fu the fundamentals. And we need to be convinced of the fundamentals. And the fundamental today we're going to talk about is the gospel, the good news. Now, 
Let's just read verses, I'm going to read verses 11 through 24 as we finish out this chapter. Galatians 1, I'm sorry, starting in verse 10. Galatians 1, 10 through 24, I'm going to read it now. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through His grace to reveal His Son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now concerning the things which I write to you, Indeed, before God, I do not lie. Afterward, I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I, was no, and I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they were hearing only, He who was formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God in me. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that we would see your glory even as we look into this passage. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Three points. Amen. Amen. There you go. That's it. We'll get this down before it's all over. Don't worry, all right? But three points to ponder from this passage. And I want to talk to you, and I, I guess what I would say is the gospel changes lives. The idea of the gospel changes lives. And we're just foundationally, look at, verses, look at verse 10, the first point is, and we see here the, the purpose of the gospel. The purpose of the gospel. Look at this, verse 10. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. And now, it's a little interesting to unfold this particular scripture. This, per, this but I, I, I break it down this way. The only way I can see to break it down. Am I here to please men or to persuade men? The idea of pleasing man or persuading man. Here's what I'm going to say to you. I'll make it very clear to you right now. I'll disclose this. I am here in a way not to persuade you this morning. Not something, I don't have anything to sell you, but I want to persuade you to believe what is within the pages of this book. I want to persuade you. I'm trying to get you to line your thinking up to what this Bible says, to what's in this Word. And that's, a, that's, that's framed in a, in, a, in a large sense. But I want you to know the God of this book. Now I know all of you, you know, most of you probably already know him. Praise God, but maybe not everybody. But what I want to say to you is, how much do you believe what he tells you? Because as I... As I look around, I'm seeing that some people, though they have the gospel, though they're Christians and they've responded to the gospel, there still is a tendency by some, maybe even by you, and, and a temptation for me to seek to take the gospel and please men with it. Think about that. Let that sink in for a minute. See, that, I want you to know something that that's what man does before Christ. 
He seeks to have pleasure, to be pleased. Everybody please me. Right? It's all about the self. Self-pleasure, or people to, to bow down and to please them. And some people do that. They take the gospel of Christ and, and they try to just do it like this. Oh, if you receive Christ in your life, your life will be much better. You're going to have this wonderful life if you receive Christ. All your problems are gone now. If you'll just receive Him into your life and pray this prayer after me. And there's some truth to that. That's my testimony. But the Christian life is not always easy. It's not the easy road. It's the narrow road. It's just the road that has great reward at the end. In many ways, it's the hard road. The disciples, including Paul himself, the easy road? Come to Christ and have your head chopped off. That's what happened to him, the Apostle Paul. But he knew it was, it, was, it, was wor- it was a worthwhile road. So he knew that I wasn't, he knew that he wasn't here to please man, but to persuade man. See, when, you wanna, when you're living to be pleased, that's the flesh. And that is what adds, there's an attractive message. When you can add some flesh to the gospel, it makes it attractive. You can, you can take it and twist it in such a way or add stuff to it that appeals to the flesh. And the flesh wants to respond to that. And I like that. I like that because it, it's, it's about pleasing man. And Paul is not, he realizes, I'm not, here to, I'm not here to please men. He says, if I please men, I won't be a bondservant of Christ. But he was all about persuading. Some people say, well, I don't want to persuade anybody. Look, when we preach the gospel, what are we doing it for? Just to tell other people, well, this is what I believe, and that's it? You just want people to know what you believe? There's a lot of people that are living that way today. They just want to tell everybody what they believe. They don't care. You get them saying it? Hopefully, our Christianity is more than that. We're going to heaven. We've got the way not just to get to heaven, but how to endure and, and soar over... The, conse- or the, uh, the, the, the circumstances, how can we have joy in the midst of what's going on in the world today? Only because we have Christ in our hearts. Why do we want to keep that to ourselves? We see that pain in the, in the people that are hurting all around us. It's selfish to want to keep Him, because Paul said they didn't turn from a way of life, they turned from Him. It's selfish to want to keep Jesus to yourself. Right? Why wouldn't you want to... Now, I want to be clear with this because the gospel itself, and we'll talk about this, that's actually point number two, but I just want to say something to you. The purpose of the gospel is to persuade man. That's it. Persuade man. Don't feel ashamed by wanting to introduce something that somebody doesn't believe in. That's what... That's what Paul did wherever he went. Now, how you do it is everything, but that idea is the first point. That we just need to get it in our minds that we want to, we want people that don't believe in Jesus to change their minds about him. Now he's very much going to do the work in that, but we have a place in that. We, but we have to be convinced of this. The gospel just hasn't been given to us so that we could be saved. So point number one, the purpose of the gospel is to persuade men that there is a judgment coming. The Bible's clear about this. Things aren't always going to go on as they are now. And by the way, look into the way things are, the birth pangs talked about in the Bible. We're getting closer to the return of Christ. We don't know the day or the hour, but it's coming. And so the time to persuade is getting short. Point number two. So the purpose of the gospel is to persuade, not to please man. It's to persuade man. We're we're very much a a feelings-based thing. It's how you feel. You ever notice that? People are asking, well, how does that make you feel? This, that, and the other. And I'm thinking... At first, I'm thinking, yeah, they care about me. How do, they care about my feelings, and how do I feel? But 
when I, one day I thought, who cares what I feel right now? I mean, it only really matters what God thinks or what God says. It's almost a getting me off line there when it's worried about how do you feel? And I'm not saying that we, we should step on people that are hurting. But when it's all said and done, the gospel never talks about your feelings. It, all, it, it matters what you believe. Now, what you believe will dictate how you feel, has a, pay, a part to play in how you feel. They're connected. All right? They're connected. Um, some days I don't, I don't feel good. Some days I, you know, ask my wife. <laughs> but the idea is some days I do, but that's, you can't go by your feelings. Now, the point number two is, we get the purpose of the gospel, to persuade, not to please. Point number two is found in verses 11 and 12. Verses 11 and 12. He says, but I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me was not according to this, not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. And point number two is, the person of the gospel. This is it. This is the central message right here. Don't miss this. If you miss the rest of it, don't miss this. He's saying, the message that I've proclaimed to you, he's reminding them, right? Taking them back to what he was preaching. It's not of this world. You seen those t-shirts? I think it's not of this world, right? This message, the gospel message, is not of this world. It's out of this world. That's a good vernacular, right? It is out of this world. It's from God himself. It's supernatural. And with this message, the gospel message, the good news, and maybe by now you're saying, well, um, well, what is the good news? Listen, I'm going to read to you um, this message that comes from heaven. It comes, it's speaking about a person. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech, or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit of, and of power, that your faith, listen to this, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. And there it rests, right there. We're talking about a person now. The question has to be right now to us. And, and contemplate this question. We can think about this. Here's the question. Is the gospel or Jesus Christ enough to fix what's broken in the world. We need, to, we need to settle that question in our mind right now. Uh, I guess you could take it home and think about it, but I, I want you to just try and settle it if you can right now. Is Jesus Christ or the gospel, the good news about him, that he came, that he died on the cross for the sins of the world, that he was buried and he rose three days later, and he's alive. The question is, is believing in him, what I just told you about him specifically, is that enough to fix what's broken in the world? Is he enough? Is he enough? Okay. A few of you say he is. All right. I appreciate your honesty for those of you that didn't toot. You're still up in the air maybe on it. All right. But this is an important question. It really is. We need to be convinced or persuaded that in fact it is enough. I saw a post from somebody who I would have thought that they, the gospel was enough. I saw a post that basically said, 
talking about all the things that are going on in the world right now, talking about people's feelings that are real. I'm not denying that. Jesus has feelings too, by the way. I want you to know that. God has feelings. So, but the idea is, in the discussion of this whole thing about, you know, all the problems, and then he said this, he said, yeah, and, and praying and, and, and the, you know, how do you put it, and the gospel of Jesus isn't enough, or not isn't enough, but he just kind of threw that out like, you know, that's not a good answer. That's, there needs to be more than that. And it made me think about this idea. And it, go, it took me right back to Galatians. Isn't that what they thought? That the gospel that they received apparently wasn't enough. They needed something more. They were open to having something added to it, the new and improved gospel. We, we have to be convinced in our hearts and minds that, or is he enough or not? Because either he is enough, he's, his power is enough, his saving power is enough, or it's not. It's only for some people, maybe for the Western world, or, by the way, Christianity didn't start in the Western world. So, is Jesus Christ enough? Is the gospel enough, the knowledge of him, and believing in him, is he enough? I talked about this two weeks ago. That Jesus is essential, right? Not just church is essential. Jesus is essential. And he's really the only essential. Yeah, that's right. You got that one, right? That's good. He is. He's all that we need. Now, I'm not saying it's simple. It, it seems like a simple answer, but for us, it's fundamental. See, these are the fundamentals of Christianity. The fundamentals. It's Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Paul says these are the fundamentals. I'm coming to you. Nothing else. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Let's stay on point. Let's stay with the fundamentals, church. Let's stay with the fundamentals. We're living in a time, not just the world. The church is believing that He's not enough. They may not say those words, but we're watching by the behavior that somehow He can't fix what's going on in the world. The men were talking on Saturday. We had a great discussion on Saturday as we baked out there in the garden. Um, and the idea came to me is, you know, as it's, it's like this. I'm talking about the church now, not the world. But it, it, it's seemingly as I'm, I'm, I'm looking at what I'm seeing in some places. And it's like, here's a sick patient dying. A sick patient's dying, and somehow we've got the cure, okay? We've got a vial of the cure right here. We just need to inject that into the patient, and they will live, right? We got it right there. It's been, however we got it, we have it, though. And over here, we got a sick patient that's dying. And then we get all these people gathered around. Take note, take nothing against physicians I'm just for my illustration the physicians are talking and other people and they're saying well now uh, they've got the, they've got it right over there and they're discussing you know how did he get the disease and, and 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 asking the patient what do you feel how do you feel right now tell me your symptoms is your pain from one to ten what is it and the whole time we've got the vial sitting right here and they just need to take the vial and inject it into the patient so they get well We've, we've got the cure. And we're, we're over here trying to analyze what's going on with the sick person. It's called sin. That's the problem. And we've got the cure for sin and death. And it's Jesus Christ. And you could, you, you know, that's, it's an illustration. You get the idea though, right? And, and we're talking about all this other stuff. And no, Jesus can fix everything. Now, either you believe that or you don't, and it will be borne out by how you live as a Christian. Where do you go? Because Christians have problems. See, the gospel isn't just about coming to Christ. It's about coming to Christ and then walking with him in the sanctification process. We all have problems as Christians. We're all being sanctified. But where do I go when I, when I have problems? Do I believe that everything that life and godliness is in the Word? Do I believe that or not? Right? 
Do I believe that? Is that the first place? Do I go to him first? Um, but the gospel is not of this world. It's, but it's a very much about a person. About, it's about Jesus Christ. And either he's powerful enough, it's either he is who he claims to be. Let me just say this to you. He made some pretty amazing claims. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. By that claim, he said, by that claim that no other, quote, religions can get you to the Father. There's only one, his way. You know, and, and people want to argue about that. Oh, I can't believe that's kind of narrow-minded. Go back to our illustration. They're over here arguing about this, why the vial sitting over here with the cure in it. Well, I can't believe this. That vial over there, there should be more than one vial. Shouldn't we have many different vials? Shouldn't there be many different elixirs that can fix the patient? Uh, the obvious one, well, we have one. Shouldn't we just apply the one we have? Amen. Thank you. He is the answer. But remember, the battle we're in, Satan tries, oh, yeah, yeah, he's the answer. Sure he is. Of course he is. You got it. But, but, but this over here, you got to bring some of the world in there too. Look at, anyway, point number three. As we go down, and, and this is from 13 to 24, our last point. All right, the first point is, the purpose of the gospel is to persuade, not to please. Point number two is, there's a person in the gospel, and it's about Christ. And either he is or he isn't the answer for, for life's problems. Now, point number three, and this is important. Point number three, and I want to say this, is the effects of the gospel. Because if these things I'm saying are true, here's what I want to say to you first. Don't believe everything everybody tells you. Well, it must, it must be true. I saw it on the internet. Or, you know, I saw it on, the, on Fox News. It's got to be true. Isn't that the conservative news station or it's somewhere else? You know, I, pick a place. Oh, well, you know what? Wikipedia, right? It's on Wikipedia. So it's got to be true. It could be or not, right? You know, then, then you got fact checker or these people that, well, this is the website that decides what's true or not. We've checked this out. Well, who's checking them out? Think about it, right? It makes sense. Who's checking them out? This is, the, this is what I know. And I, believe, I totally believe this, people. The only thing that I know to be true, for sure, is in this book. I believe that. Yeah, and outside of that, I just, I'm, I'm a little skeptical, but, um, but I'm just saying that point number three if these things are true that I'm telling you right now, okay, and I believe they are, there should be some effects from that. There should be some evidence. Don't believe everything you're told. If these things are true, there should be some evidence, right? And we have a lot of it, by the way, and I'm not going to go into all of it. I'm going to go into one point, and here's what's happening from verses 13 to 24. Paul is talking about his personal testimony. So what's the proof? The Apostle Paul is the proof. His life. His changed life. That's right, I'm getting to you, sister. I'm getting to you. Because you are the proof. The Apostle Paul is with the Lord now. We can't go find him. You are the proof if you're a born-again Christian. There should be no... You should be more... You need to see that in your own life first. Do you remember? Think about it. The works of God, how He changed your heart how he changed your mind, how he, when you surrender your life to him, man, he just comes into your life and things are different. Think about this. If the God of the universe who created us actually can, we can invite him into our lives and into our heart and mind, if that, and this is what the scriptures teach, right? To as many as received him, to those he gives the right to be the children of God, to those who believe in his name. Now, if the, if the God of the universe who created us comes into our lives, 
do you think there'd be any evidence of that? Or, you know, it's just kind of, well, he's in there somewhere, and, and hopefully, come on, think about that. We don't check our brains at the door. There has to be some evidence of him being in there, right? Of course. And the evidence is the changed life. Changed life. This is the effect of the gospel, the good news. And he's reminding them now. Remember what happened when, you, when I gave you... Sometimes people think the gospel is too simple. I remember one Christian man, um, he was a pastor years ago. And he was talking about... I forget what he's talking about, but he, was, he, was, he says, well, you know, it's, everybody thinks that you have to, when you sing songs, it's got to be Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Now, obviously... We, can, we believe we can sing more than just Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There are other words we can sing. But there was a part of me that kind of like, went, oh, man. You got to be careful when you say something like that. Because in a way, it makes me think that um, it makes him less somehow. And, not, and my thing is, we, we need to think more of him, not less of him. Right? And, but the idea, the effects of the gospel are changed lives changed lives we look at the world today and we see what's going on and and as christians we see that it's it's sin is the is the problem i hope you know that by now but what's the fix some people just want to talk about how does this make people feel and instead let's fix the jesus died and he rose again so the problem could be fixed you know i'm fixed i'm not finished yet but I'm not the person I used to be. And none of you people even know me, who I used to be. My wife doesn't even really know who I used to be. We've been married 25 years. She, she, she wasn't there when I was the person that I used to be. And I'm not bragging. I haven't arrived, just ask her. She'll tell you. Well, she's too polite. She probably won't tell you everything, but But I can tell you, if I look at my own life, I've changed. I've just changed. My desires have changed. Don't misinterpret what I'm saying. I'm not the standard for righteousness. But I'm saying this because I can only really know what's going on here. But I want to say something else. I've watched some of you. I say some of you because some of you I don't know that well. I mean, I'm not around you enough. Now, you... And you, I, I, I'm around you guys more. And you too. But I'm saying I can see the evidence of Christ in you. I see in a changed life in you. And I've heard some of your stories of where you, where you were. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to be some horrible person that did terrible things. But it doesn't matter who you are. Before you were in Christ, you were selfish. You were living your own life. But when you come to Christ, look what the Apostle Paul said. Look what he said about himself. He was a religious guy. If you would have looked at Paul on the surface and judged him, oh, this this guy loves God. He was killing Christians. That's what Paul was involved. He was so religious that he was murdering Christians. Paul says this. He says, for you have heard of my, listen to this, Former conduct. You all had a former conduct before you came to Christ. That's what we're talking about. A former conduct. Whatever that was. When you come to Christ, it was former. It's in the past. Listen to what the Bible says about this. 1 Corinthians 2. I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Listen to this. This is good news. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone, anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Not just some things. Not just most things. All things have become new. You're a new creature. Listen. Listen. Christ didn't come to make evil people good. So what? No. 
He came to make dead people alive. Yeah, that's right. People that don't know Christ, and I don't mean this in a disparaging manner, they're dead. They're the walking dead. They don't know what life is. You remember? You thought you had a life, whatever it looked like. This was it. Some of us came to the end of that and realized, this is not worth living. If this is all there is, it's not worth living or whatever we came to. Because I wasn't living life. Living life apart from Christ is not life. Life is knowing Him, being in Him. And Paul is trying to tell them, hey man, look what he says. He's trying to get them to think a little bit. He says, you've heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. You can't do more of a 180. There's not probably more of a testimony of somebody turning their, their life around than the Apostle Paul. He goes from trying to wipe out Christianity, trying to kill Christians, and wipe it off the face of the map, to being the chief proponent, you could say, of Christianity. This is amazing. I mean, how did, he didn't get educated. He didn't go to seminary in that situation. He, got, he had an encounter with Christ. Look what it says. He called it, in, th in 12, it was a revelation of Christ. But he goes on, verse 14, he says, I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. And then he says, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, there it is, verse 16, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. Now, there it was. Remember, the road to Damascus. He's, his plan was, his heart was, I'm going there, I got my papers, I'm going to capture some Christians. I'm going to do some Christians in, I'm going to wipe it off the face of the earth. He's on his way to Damascus, he's outside. And then he, this light at noonday sun, brighter than the noonday sun, just blinds him. And then he hears a voice right there. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? His name was Saul back then, right? Before he was the Apostle Paul. God even gave him a new name. Why are you persecuting me? I mean, you talk about a, a, an experience. And what did he say? He said, he said, who are you, Lord? And what would you have me to do? There it shows the surrender of the heart right there. He didn't pray some prayer. And I'm not against praying some prayer to invite Christ in. But there it was. Who are you, Lord? He's, he's saying, I'm, I'm submitting to you. And what would you have me to do? That shows a submissive heart. Whatever he was believing before, he realized that at that point when he had that revelation, this was real. And whatever I'm doing now that seemed right before, I know this is right. And he was willing to just set his life down. And what, Lord, what do you want me to do? That was his experience with Christ right there. That was his receiving of Christ right there. And, and that needed to happen in each person's life. And it's, it's different in each one of our lives. You had your own encounter with Christ, if you're born again. You had your own encounter. It was very personal. He's a personal God. He met you where you were. Or maybe he's meeting you where you are right now. Maybe you haven't come to Christ, but you're, you're, you're seeing your need for him right now. And so the Apostle Paul, I just want to, Skip down to the last 23, verse 23 and 24. And he says this, he says, But they were hearing only, He who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God in me. Your life... Surrendered to Christ, transformed, 
brings glory to God. There's no higher call. You know, people talk about, oh, we have a higher call. The highest call is surrendering your life to the Lord and, and being open to and saying yes to, like the Apostle Paul did on the road there to Damascus. What would you have me to do? In other words, what, what's your plan for me, God? I, I want that. That's the highest call. And in that, it says, and they glorified God in me. This idea of the effects of the gospel is to change life, your life. Your life, and somebody said this, I don't know who it was, but they said, you know, your life may be the only Bible that somebody ever reads. Hopefully that's not the case. But your life, they're watching you. Your family members that don't know Christ are watching you. The people at work are watching you. People all around us, they, they're watching you, and you know it because the first time that you do something that's unchristian, like... They'll point, you call yourself a Christian? Like, you think, oh, they're watching, number one. And number two, they have an understanding of what a Christian may be supposed to be like, right? That just lets you know that you're being watched. Now, but this, I just want to tell you that the same Jesus that transformed and is sanctifying you day by day is the same God that wants to transform all those who don't know him yet. What's happening in the world because they don't know any better. They're coming up with solutions to fix people's their issues that they have, the hurt that they contain, or whatever is going on in the, in the life. And they see these people and they want to help them, and they're trying to help them with the wisdom of man. It's temporary at best, and it will eventually frustrate people. Because there's really no hope for sin outside of Jesus Christ. That's the problem that we're seeing in the world around us. It's sin, and it's being manifested in our, in our midst. That's what it is. Because sin left unchecked, this is the problem. People are they're not happy. They're just not happy. They're not content with their lives. There's just no peace in their lives. And they're trying to find it in the wrong ways. Jesus is the answer. You have the answer. The question is, what are we going to do about it? Because the world's telling me that, you know, that's not the answer. It can't be that simple. Well, it works for you. That doesn't mean it's going to work for everybody. I know, you need a crutch. It's your crutch. Christians need a crutch. And I like what somebody said about that. No, Christianity's not a crutch. You know what I'm going to say, some of you? It's a hospital. That's what it is. It's a hospital. Jesus has the answers. Now, how you present him is everything. You know, you go up to somebody, it's hurting, and say, You're going to hell! You need to receive Jesus as your Savior so you don't go to hell. Well, that's a little harsh, especially when somebody's hurting. That's an extreme example, okay? That's an extreme example. I mean, I'm not saying there's not a time that that line could never be used like I did. I mean, I guess. But by and large, the good news about the gospel is not only does he give us the information, but he gives us his spirit to be those that lovingly present the truth in love. And this is something that's going to be different for every encounter that you have. You're going to have to trust the Lord in each situation that He's going to give you the wisdom, that the love of God is going to be working through you because you're not the same creature that you were. He's equipped you for this point in time. But what I'm saying to you today is you need to believe that the gospel's enough. And I'm telling you that you either believe that or you don't. To say that, ah, I'm not really sure. No, you don't believe it then. It doesn't mean you can't believe it in the future. But you've got to be honest. Either you believe it or you don't. That Jesus is enough or he's not. Well, it's not that simple. I'm sorry, but it is that simple. It's fundamental. 
Paul's teaching that in the book of Galatians. Stick around long enough and you'll get that over and over and over. You'll be convinced, hopefully, at the end of Galatians that it's the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ that transforms a life. We all need to be changed. Every one of us. There's not one of us that's arrived. Not one of us. And I know you all know that. Because the Holy Spirit's bearing witness. You're bearing witness to what the Holy Spirit's saying. Amen to that. I, I didn't hear any horns go off on that, but it's true. Too late. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. But it's true. Where would we be without Him? i tell you where we'd be. We'd be out there with everybody else. That's where we'd be. We'd be on the news. That's where we'd be. We can forget that sometimes because of our tight little group. And I love our tight little group. But the church is not just about our, our tight little group. Let's get this tight little group and make sure that we all go to heaven. Well, that's important. But we're already going there because we believe in Jesus. But there's a lot of people that are going by right now. All, you see all these, these people going by? Now, I don't know who's driving these cars. There's people in them. I know that. And all, there's a lot of people that don't know Jesus Christ that are going by here every day. Every single day. That are perishing. And Jesus died for their sins. But do you believe that He is enough? He is enough. To change the direction of a life. He was enough for the Apostle Paul, he was enough for Saul. He did a 180. And you can say in your life, hopefully, that he changed you. You're not the person you used to be. But he wants to use you in these days. These last days. We're living in the last days. And he wants to use you, but you must be convinced that Jesus is enough. Because if you don't believe it, don't think that you're going to be able to persuade somebody else. You need to believe it. It's true. Look at your own life. Look at your own life. What we're going to do, um, we're going to pray, and I'm going to give anybody a chance that wants to receive Jesus as their Savior. If you've never done that, maybe for the first time, you can receive Christ as your Savior. He died for your sins. He died for the sins of the world. The Bible says that for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. To as many, to as, many as received Him, to those He gives the right to be the children of God, to those who believe in His name. If you confess the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. I'm not going to take for granted that everybody here is saved today. You can go to church for years and not, still not be saved. There needs to be a point in time where you surrender your life like Paul did on the road to Damascus, where you, you just, Lord, what would you have me to do? You're just laying down your life. Maybe you're doing that for the first time today. Or it's the same prayer if you, if you are coming back to Christ. Maybe you, you ask him into your heart a long time ago, and then you just went off and did your own thing. That's happened to a lot of people. But now you're wanting to come back to him. You're seeing your need for him in your life. You're seeing that void in your life, and you've made your own little plan, your own little life you constructed. You, Jesus was way back there, and you're so way out in left field now, and you realize, man, this life without him, it's just wrong. And, and, you, and you, maybe today you're coming back. And you want Him to be the center, the most important part of your life. It's about the person of Christ. So the prayer is the same. So I'm going to pray for that first, and then I'm going to pray for you that already know Christ. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank You for Your Word. Thank You for Jesus Christ. Lord, that You sent Your Son to come to this planet to pay the price for our sins. And we believe that Jesus is who He claims to be. We believe that He came to this planet almost 2,000 years ago now. 
that he walked this earth as a man, that he went to that Roman cross and he gave his life. No man took it. He gave his life so that we could be saved. And we believe that he was buried. He died and that he was buried and he rose from the dead three days later. And we also believe, Jesus, that you're alive right now. We believe that you're here with us. And also, Lord, you're, omni, you're, you're omnipresent, but you're also in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, waiting to come back to the planet. So there's things we don't, there's a mystery, Lord. We believe these things. Your word tells us. And Lord, we want to pray now for anyone here that isn't right with you, that wants to get right right now, that wants to receive you into their heart as Lord and Savior, that wants to come back to you to get right with you right now. If that's you, I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now to do just that, to get right with God. He'll hear you. He'll come into your life. He'll forgive you. And it's to be the great start of a new life. Let's pray. Father, we pray for those right now who want to have a new life, who want to be new creatures, a new creation, that want to live with you being the Lord of their life. And if that's you, just pray this prayer, mean it in your heart, and God will hear you. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Lord, I've sinned against you, and I... I ask you to forgive me. I want to follow you all the days of my life. So come into my heart. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And help me to walk with you and to trust you and to rely on you. Put my full trust in you, Lord, and I just... Commit this to you. We we'll pray it to you, Jesus, and I pray it in your name. And Lord, we pray for your church in these last days. Those that have been beneficiaries of your grace. Those that have changed lives. That have been redeemed. That have seen the evidence of your power in our lives. Lord, we're sinners saved by grace. We know that. And we pray in these last days, Lord, that we would answer the call. That there's a world that needs to be told about you or persuaded. And we can't do it with our own words, Lord, our own wisdom. But we can do it with the gospel. We believe it's the power of God unto salvation. So, Lord, set the table for us. Give us divine opportunities the people that we've been praying for, the people that we've been talking to about you, Lord, give us an opportunity to, to present Christ to them. We just commit that to you. And we pray that you would embolden us, that you'd baptize us afresh in your Holy Spirit, and that your power would be at work in our lives not for our own glory, but to bring you glory, Lord. And may our lives reflect your Son, Jesus. And we pray these things in his precious name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen? Hey, hey, hey. Amen. Now, God bless you. Now, when you leave today, just a reminder, there'll be a, there's, some, there's some people that want to pray for you. If you pray to receive the Lord for the first time or you're coming back to the Lord, hey, don't leave. Get some prayer. Let them pray with you and, and let them know. You know, confessing the Lord is, is telling someone too, is, is, is telling someone else. Tell them as you're exiting. You'll see some signs over there. They'll say pray that prayer this way. You know, you can turn in there and get some prayer. If you need prayer for anything, they're there to pray with you. And um, um, please be careful on your way out. You know, I know, you know, it's not the Indy 500. Just be careful as you're leaving, as you're exiting. 
Um, there are people in the parking lot. Uh, but God bless you this week. And you've been called for such a time as this. This is your call. It's not by mistake. This is your time, you could say, to minister to a hurting world. So let God use you this week. May he bless you. May he make his face to shine upon you this week. May he empower you by his spirit this week. And may he give you divine opportunities to speak his love to someone in need. In the name of Jesus. Amen.